أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على مبعوث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Uh, so uh, continuing in the Tafsir Surah Al Baqarah, uh, trying to gain the blessing and the favor that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had mentioned, he said any home in which Surah Al Baqarah is recited, um, the devils and the demons will run away. What does that mean? A man came to me one time, he said, Imam, I know that we believe in the hadith and all of that, and I've listened to the proofs and the evidence, and it's very strong, the, the, the verification system is strong. I agree. I'm not here to question that. But he said, I'm having a hard time with the, the meaning of a hadith. And I said, okay, um, go ahead. He said, the hadith says that um, any house, that Surah Al-Baqarah is recited in, um, that the devils will go away from that house. He said, and my wife is a very big believer in this to the extent that almost all the time, she's turning on the uh, DVD and the Sheikh is reciting Surah Al-Baqarah. The same time, while Surah Al-Baqarah is going on, people get into fights, start yelling and screaming and angry and beating kids and all kind of stuff. I'm pretty sure that's the work of Shaitan. How do you explain this? So I said, Sheikh, yeah, this is a big uh, uh, problem, uh, brother, that this is the... Uh, uh, Ummah has gone to what I call a Ramziyah. In Arabic they call Ramziyah. The symbolic religion. The superficial religion. The facade religion. And that is that uh, the Qur'an and the Kaaba are like holy talismans. That we hold it, we kiss it, we carry it, we touch it. And then we're soaking up some sort of mystical blessings and it's touching us in some special way. And uh, as we look at the Ummah, as that is a very widespread attitude, we see it's probably not the right angle. Um, and when we look at the Holy Qur'an, it says at the very beginning, describing what the whole thing is about, it says, Huda lil this, this guy, this book, its purpose is to be guidance for those who are mindful of their soul and their responsibility to the maker of their soul and the provider of everything that we have in life. So, Surah Al-Baqarah carries the most extensive reservoir of understanding of spirituality, creed, law, um, and uh, um, lifestyle system. So what is being said is, those who study Surah Al-Baqarah, and thus it affects their lives, then by those means and by that application, the devil will have no way to intrude upon their affairs. So a lot of people are stuck in this, how much Quran can I read? How much Quran can I read? How much can I recite? How much can I memorize? And it is not becoming a means of guidance, it's a means of trying to rack up hasanat, which is, many scholars have understood that in that way, which is fine, I, I have no problem with that, but uh, we're missing the point. We're missing the priority. So we are now, I think, on the 27th and the 28th ayah of, uh, of Surah Al-Baqarah, Man and Creation. We're talking about the purpose of life and understanding uh, where life comes from, what it's all about, and who is the one who is taking care of all of that and our relationship with it. So the essence of faith and the quest for eternity. كَيْفَ تَكْفُرُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَكُمْتُمْ أَمْوَاتًا How could you disbelieve in God and you were once non-existent? When it says amwata, the idea of mayit is something that is not alive. So mayit for someone who has been alive is someone who is no longer alive. Inanimate, right? Dead. For someone who has not been alive, it is someone who is non-existent. He then gave you life, then caused you to die, and He will then resurrect you again, and to Him you will return. So, the famous Plato uh, proverb or uh, maxim, I think therefore I am. This is something unique to human beings. There are no animals and no... Uh, they've been studying monkeys and because of Darwinism and all of that they're trying to make it out that we're like some you know <coughs> smart monkeys or whatever 
but they're still not able to um, identify for any other being the sense of self determination, self conscious moral awareness. This idea of where I fit in the world and what's going on and who I am as opposed to what's going on around me and how I differ with others and purpose and meaning and all that. No other being besides human beings have that. So the historical philosophers have said that is that sense of consciousness is a huge important point. It's not just useless life forms. It's rather a purposeful life form. So that's what we're talking about, the purpose of life. So therefore the burden of responsibility comes. If I know that I am part of cause and effect, and I know that things that I will do will impact others, and that that will either bring good results or bad results. It will either be productive and creative and beneficial, or it will be destructive and harmful. That will be the two modes of influence that I could have. So because I'm aware of this, I should be responsible. And obviously that is the understood belief in the divine truth that caused everything to come into existence. Um, the Qur'an says, أَمْ خُلِقُوا مِنْ غَيْرِ شَيْءٍ أَمْ هُمُ الْخَالِقُونَ This sentence, or these two sentences, um, were, was pe were people created from nothing? They just popped up out of nowhere? Or did they create themselves in their pride and arrogance? So the fact is, is that things don't just pop up out of nowhere, regardless of what Lawrence Krauss and the Arizona State Physics Department says. Things do not pop up out of nowhere, out of a vacuum of completely nothingness. There is some sort of interaction with existing particles and how they connect and so forth. So, what we know is that this existence is there and we are conscious. So we know we didn't create ourselves. And we know that we came from somewhere. And we know we are intelligently designed And if you just look in yourselves, even if we just took the eyeball, just go home and study the eyeball. And then you tell me that this concept of eyeball is just some haphazard event based upon some chaos ordering itself according to just luck. You convince me of that. After just studying the eyeball, much less cells and blood and white blood cells and this and nutrients and the distribution of elements within your body and getting rid of what's harmful and, and by natural processes. You have no conscious awareness of this. It's just going on for you. If you just study how bees work, how ants work, and how they work together, and the sophisticated communication, and what that means to the environment. I was watching this uh, documentary on what it meant when they uh, let loose some endangered wolves into an environment that they should be in. You hear about this? Allahu Akbar. This benefited the whole environment. Now they're killing deers. Some of them are all poor deers. But what that meant for the rest of the environment, Allahu Akbar. I'm not trying to get to avatar on you. But there is a symbiotic connection between all life forms on earth and we are the Khalifa. We're about to get there in the next two, in the next, actually that's the next. You see how it's bringing it in? You see how Allah is bringing the point? He's getting to the nitty gritty so that you can understand purpose and self and essence and source. And then now you can realize the serious responsibility you have as the children of Adam. Right? So that's, uh, that's that. The beginning is as I mentioned in Swift Al. With Akhada Rabbu Kamim Bani Adama Min Zurri Yet Min Zuhuri Him Zurri Yetahum Wa Ashadahum Ada Anfusim Alas to be Rabbi Kum Kalu Bala Shahidina. So the ayah is saying, Remember or be uh, on notice that all of the children of Adam, all human souls, were created before they were in their mother. And they were given conscious awareness to recognize the Lord, the light that is appearing to the one that would see it as a created entity, which we know from the Quran and Sunnah, that's what you would see 
some sort of light, like no other light, but some amazing, engulfing, comforting presence of comfort and truth and understanding of ultimate, absolute reality. Nuru Samawati So this soul, all souls, are given consciousness. And then it is said to them, Am I your Lord? And they say, Of course you are our Lord. That's all we know. And then the soul is given to an angel, and the angel takes it and puts it into the mother's womb sometime around four months into the pregnancy. Now we're not going to get into all the rules about abortion and all that, but that's, uh, that's what we know from the, from the scripture. So, this is the beginning of all of us. We are all innately, inherently aware of our Creator. And this is not an opinion, this is a historical fact. The large 90 percentiles of human history believe in a supreme being. Every language has a word that represents the supreme creator of the universe. This is a human reality. It's not invented. We're watching the Morgan Freeman thing. It gets really annoying because he's obviously some sort of agnostic. But the story of God, he calls it, the uh, Discovery Channel thing. But he was studying the history of it. He was like, yeah, you find it in all of the, you know, he was discussing the thing that people say when humans invented God. Well, what we know is historically we've known about God. And there were people who talked on behalf of God in all peoples. As it says, uh, uh, To every nation was sent a messenger sent, saying to them, worship the one and only God and avoid evil and corruption. So that's the human reality. So then at the end it says, lest they will say on the day of judgment we are unaware of this. There's a Navy officer, a naval officer, who he, can't, he was, uh, I think in California coast, doing something in the Pacific Ocean, and they were part of a smaller boat, or whatever it was, the ocean got really bad. He was an atheist from his family growing up. They're not, they're not believers in God. Actually, they're part of that group of atheism that has a religion of hating religion and mocking the concept of God as some sort of corny, foolish idea. This guy in the clouds with the lightning bolt. So he's been one of those that was raised saying, these idiots believing in this thing, they can't see or hear or touch or feel and all that nonsense. That's how he's talking his whole life. So he's out there in the ocean and everything, and then the sea is getting bad, and it looks like they're about to tip over and, and all of that. He said, I couldn't help it. I was like, God, if you're there, help me. Now, according to his whole life, according to who he was and what he believed, that is the most stupid, ridiculous statement he could have made. But he admits that he felt compelled to take that option, even though he's thinking his whole life that's ridiculous. Came to the, uh, you know, he got, he was saved, right? <laughs> so he met some Muslim. A Muslim gave him a translation of the Quran. This is a real story. He's reading. He opened up into Surah Yunus. Oh wow! Randomly, and he's reading through it, and there it comes. There will be someone in the ocean and they will be a disbeliever and then they will see the waves hitting and death will be imminent and they will call out God if you just save me then I will believe and do the right thing then when they go to the uh, land a disaster would be that they would live a life that is not in remembrance and not taking heed so he became a devout Muslim from this eye because it's deep down everybody knows it I've met so many atheists who became Muslim, some, even some of them became Christian and elsewhere. They, when they embrace it, they, knew, they admit they were always suppressing it. And that's the interesting thing. If you get the Yahya Emmerich translation of the Qur'an, you should. If you want to read a good English translation of the Qur'an, uh, Qur'an in today's English by Yahya Emmerich, I, I'll be honest with you. There is a brother uh, from another city that he liked the appeal that I made one time to him where I was explaining to the community that 
Maybe some of you, mashallah, you know the language of the Quran, you've studied the Arabic, traditional Arabic, you're born in an Arab country, but now, don't you find yourself at a disadvantage when trying to explain things sometimes to your children or non-Muslims because you don't know how to ex exactly express that or explain that. So if you will study translations, that will help you to be able to communicate with a very uh, you know, well-researched presentation of the thing. So the brother said, all right, he came up to me. He said, what should I, I, I yeah, yeah. Brother came up to me in like two weeks. He got it. He was like, man, I spent all night last night, like five hours. I stood up, I was like almost up till Fajr. He was like, and I was just reading, he was like, it's like tafsir, man. I was like, that's exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. It's the Quran, it's Quran, it's Mus'haf, you have it. Any rendering in any other language or even in Arabic is called tafsir. He was like, man, that has, I mean, I was learning stuff and that's what it is. You will learn from different scholars. Anyways, back to the point. The kafirun, he translates as suppressors of faith. That's how I, because the word kafara is, we took the English word cover, was taken from kafara. Cover has, because kafara, kafartuhu, kafartuhu, cover it up. Can't see it, I've covered it, right? So there's faith there. So in order to disbelieve, you have to be like, no, it's not there. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not really there. I, I don't really believe, you know. So that's, with all due respect to all my uh, friends and, and brothers and sisters in humanity that choose not to believe, you just look into your soul and you'll see this point. Um, so that's what, on the day of judgment, people can't come and say, well, I never had any idea about God. So people get into this thing, we've talked about it before, and we have to reiterate it because so many Muslims and Christians and Jews have extremists that are on a power trip. I own religion. We're going to heaven, they're going to hell. We're the believers, those are the disbelievers, that's how it is. Believe it or not. Hold on, bro. Take a step back and listen to how you sound. Yeah. Are you Maliki or Medina? Or are we praying to Maliki or Medina all the time? Are you the one making decision on the Day of Judgment? So yes, we are accountable to a basic understanding of God and basic morality. This is for al hamaha fujura wa taqwa. But if somebody does not know about a certain revelation or was given the complete wrong exposure to it, and therefore probably wasn't interested in it, that is probably going to be more the fault of the people who should have been properly presenting the message in, in the area. They're going to carry that on the day of We want to make it their fault. See, it's them. Alhamdulillah, I have my halal restaurant, my masjid, and my house, and we go around there, and Alhamdulillah, we're Muslim, Allah loves us. Those kufar don't know about them. You're responsible for them, bro. You moved here. This is where you chose to live. It's serious. All the Prophet Sallallahu companions understood it this way. That's why we have Malaysia and Indonesia and all that. There was no battle anywhere there. You have like 300 some million Muslims in that area between Philippines, Indonesia and Malaysia. There was never any political Islamic caliphate there. Just some Muslim trader said, I have to go live amongst these people. I should be a, a proud Muslim who lives my values and promotes the truth that I know and let people know why I do what I do and what it means to know God and purpose and all of that. And then uh, people were like really impressed. Well, a lot of Muslims are like, man, I got a slide under the radar. I'm getting a good salary and I'm like working on this green card thing. Brother, don't worry. Allah's with you, man. <laughs> don't worry, man. It's all good. You just be who you are. Some people think that either you're this offensive, harsh the instigator of debates on religion, like Ahmadidah or something like this, or you just don't say anything at all. No, Islam is a balance. So, uh, on the Day of Judgment, we are going to witness about God and the reality of God that we knew we are responsible. So the next point is, uh, in the grave, we will await our reality. A lot of people ask questions. What happens when I die? Because basically what it's saying is, you are not existence, then He creates you, you have life, and then He will bring you to death, you will all die, and then He will resurrect you again. Every last one of us. Everyone's going to be resurrected. So in the grave, we're awaiting resurrection. And they have, in their reality, after death, they will find now they have a place of waiting until they are resurrected. 
So in a nutshell, what the Qur'an and the Sunnah teach us is, you die, angels come to you, they will take your soul from your body, they will go to the heavens and they will present your soul, and then you will either be known as one or the other, then your soul will be brought back down to your body, specifically the coccyx bone in your spine. It's the part of your body that pretty much is always going to stay pretty well solid, very solid part of you. And then you wait. And so in this place in the grave, a couple of angels will come to you and question you about your understanding of God, about your understanding of prophethood, and your understanding of purpose and life, religion. So then you'll wait. You'll see visions of where your eventual abode will be. And you will feel it. You'll be seeing visions. And if you are of heaven, you'll feel like it's all comfortable, perfect temperature, smelling like flowers and bliss and the feeling of warmth and comfort in a perfect way. Or you'll feel like you're restricted and like, you know, worms are eating you and bugs are crawling through you and you can't breathe. And this is the other side. Uh, may Allah protect us from that. So when we say, when it says, الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَتُمْ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُمْ The culture of Muslims has said, what this means is when somebody dies, you're supposed to say that to them. Actually, it's a much, much more overarching, fundamental, deep concept than that. That's a very small... Aspect. Actually, nowhere does the ayah say when somebody dies, you say that. What it says is, and when uh, the patient people are those who, when afflicted with adversary, adversity, they say, indeed, we are of God, inna lillah. We're His property, we're of Him, and to Him we will return. So, um, what that means is, don't expect this to be heaven. Don't try to make heaven out of this place. Don't think I'm staying here, I'm comfortable, I've got the houses and cars and all this stuff and the gadgets and everything. Don't think like that. So my brother's like, man, but I got that Benz and I got the BMW and all that stuff. I mean, you can have it if you, you know, according to your blessing that Allah has given you. famous hadith. Inna Allah yuhibbu an yara athra ni'matihi ala abdihi. It's a famous hadith or something. Allah would like to see if He has blessed you that you would appreciate that blessing. So if you wear nice clothing and you there because that's what you do, that's, that's fine. But don't have three cars or three or ten suits that you don't ever need. Make sure that you're using it and it's taking care of the responsibility you need from it. So let's realize that we are not even we're not in charge of ourselves. We don't own our body. It's not ours. We didn't make it. We didn't deserve it. Did anybody deserve to be created? You did not. You were blessed. You were chosen to exist. Some people take it to the next point and they say, you were chosen to be Muslim. You were not chosen to be Muslim. You will choose or not choose to be Muslim. And you're responsible for that choice. This thing, we're chosen, Allah chose us and they doomed them. What do you think, he's playing some sick game of puppeteer? No, he's Rabbul Alameen. Alim will be that to Surah Hakim. Alim al Khabir. He's doing things based upon where people incline. Human beings are responsible for their own decisions. You, you were chose to have life and to exist, and you are responsible for it. So it's his property he gave you, this body and this soul. He's saying take care of both of them, and I'll give you a system. Once you know of the system, now if you act like you don't care, you don't read Quran very much, you don't look into the life of the Prophet ﷺ for divine guidance and renew that and go deeper with that as much as you can. I can tell you, I have met some Imams that what I came to know of them is that they went, they studied for some years, got a degree, and they're like, I'm Imam, and so now that's it. I know my stuff and I'm the leader and I'm the scholar. In my experience, there's no end to this knowledge. There's no end. I mean, 2002, I started, it's been like, what, 15 years now I've been studying. I keep reading new books and new sheikhs and new opinions all the time. There is no, I've learned it all and now I'm sheikh or scholar. You're always a student of knowledge as a believer. Maybe some know more than others. Maybe some can remind some that have more information, a deeper understanding, or an experience that helps them to understand something they thought they understood. We all have that. So it's a long process of life, of renewing faith and establishing spirituality as the ultimate priority in the life.
Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. We're his. We're going to return to him, meaning we're his property. He's allowed us to have his property. And we're responsible for how we took care of that. So we'll return to him and he's going to ask you, what did you do? Really, that kind of presentation is not really as professional as it should be. You will know when the book hits your head that were you. And then if you try to argue, you know you're on the wrong side of the thing. When you're arguing about it, probably you didn't do it right. Because you need to prove yourself. Because proof is in the pudding. Actions and words speak for themselves. And if you're doing the right way, everybody will know it. And really, that all that matters who knows it <coughs> is him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, uh, so that's what we call it, inaba and toba. These two words, these two words mean to turn back. Toba, taba, inaba. To return back, to turn back to. That's what these means. It's saying, I know I'm going to make mistakes. I'm flawed. I came from perfection. I can keep going back to him and he will remove my flaws. And I want to make sure I meet him like that. So I live a daily life of destroying my egotistical, selfish desires, going back to him saying, cleanse me of that because I know I'm flawed and I need you to cleanse me of that. So what the scholar said, seeking knowledge empowering people around you to help you in this process. The spiritual path is so amazing. When I was a new Muslim, it was all about information and evidences of rules and beliefs that you must have that are right versus wrong. There's a place for learning these things. But if you don't have the spiritual path, it doesn't matter if you memorize the whole Qur'an, you memorize all the law books, and you know all the rules that any scholar ever said. If you're not on the spiritual path, that will not benefit you. What is the spiritual path? لا أقسم بالنفس اللومان The soul that says, you know what? I'm first accusing myself before I accuse anyone else. I'm ready to say, you know what? I've got flaws. I'm sure that I'm not seeing it. So I said, the believer is a mirror for his brother. Because I don't see it. Myself, I can't see my own flaws. I need someone else to tell me. That's why I, you know, pick spiritual people that I'm around, that I empower, and I say, please remind me. And that's why we should all have that in our homes. Husband and wife, children. Empower them. You tell Baba if he's acting in a way that you feel is disrespectful or harsh or mean. They'll tell you. You say, Astaghfirullah, you're right. Now you're on the spiritual path. But anytime you're like, look, this is, I know, I'm doing it right, always, then you're not on the spiritual path. You're on the path of shaitan. No matter how much knowledge or information or Qur'an memorizing you've done, that is not the way. And you have to, it's an epiphany for everyone who starts it. Because I'll tell you, whenever I started it, I had been Muslim for about four years, and I had read lots of books. Rad Salihin, I read through it many times. Mukhruj with many times. Jawla. Okay? I was thinking I knew the rules and what you're supposed to say and like that kind of thing. Then when a sheikh broke me down and he was like, yeah, 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 this is your problem. Look at the way you act. I was upset. I was annoyed. I was like, what? That's not what it is. He was like, but you look at the way you talk, the way you act. And I was like, come on, man. I was, I was pushing back. He kept doing it in a way that made me think afterwards. Man. That's going to be hard to change. But with Allah, that's why we call it a tawakkul He will make it easy for you if you just put it in His hands. If you rely upon Him through His guidance, through His system that He set out through the Prophet ﷺ and all the guided people, you'll be in good shape. He's the one that created for you, for your interest, لكم, for your benefit, لنفعكم, لفائدتكم. He has created for you everything on the earth. They say, So, you know, like, mashallah, they're like, see, the oil is ours, it's in the earth. So, 
obviously this room is filled with all kind of sophisticated technology that uh, it came from the earth, all of it. Everything you have here is from the earth. And he makes it so easy for us because we find things in the earth that makes it easier and he's given us this means to use it. Some capitalist Muslim was arguing with me. I don't know how you can be a capitalist Muslim, but he says he is. He says, his brother says, I'm a libertarian capitalist Muslim. I was like, I'm going to have to disagree with those descriptions. It doesn't make sense to me. But that's what I am. Okay, that's what you are. Lakum dinukum So then he says, Allah has told us we can have whatever we want here. And do whatever we want with it. I said, even if it means destroying the whole earth and dooming our free existence, because that's what this capitalist thing is doing. And they're telling us all, don't worry, it's okay, it's all a big scam. Because why? They don't care. These people believe in money, they worship it. When they die, they don't care what happened after them by a couple of generations. Even if the whole world is destroyed, as long as they died rich and had everything they needed, and every dime they extracted from the earth. Look, you guys can, we'll go solar with you once we extract all this oil and make every penny we can. No, you can't do that. Because it's his earth. لِلَّهِ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَا تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ Do not cause corruption in the earth. If sad, something that's good, you ruin it. Cutting down all of the rainforests is if sad. Put it, have you guys seen the garbage swirl in the Atlantic the size of Texas? It will blow your mind. It's just all kind of trash. Most of the plastics and stuff. At the rate that we are going, landfills won't solve. Did y'all see Wally? Gonna not see Wally. Saw Wally. You know what I'm talking about. We're in a bad situation. It's not looking good for us. We cannot just keep developing trash and just filling the earth with it. But we're not seeing it like that. Why? Because we're not knowing who gave us this earth and what kind of responsibility we have over it. So there are various verses in the Qur'an where Allah says that He has subjugated everything to your benefit. Now, the benefit is conditional that you use it in a way that is beneficial and productive. As-shari'ati ja'at bi tahsil al-masalih wa dar al mafasid all the scholars pretty much agree. The whole purpose of the law of God on earth is to bring about individual and social welfare to be creatively, productively beneficial in the best interest of the world and the people in it and the animals and everything else and to avert or remove individual or social corruption, harm and destruction. That's the whole purpose of the law. So we are responsible for that. So Muslims should be on top of the uh, climate change thing, are we? No, because we have all the people who want to make as much money as the others uh, joining in this thing. So we were created with this individual. Uh, oh yeah, the basis. So the scholars said, "Who are the khalaqalakum mafil arbi jamia?" What they said is the scholars extract. He made for you on everything. It's he made for your interest. Everything on earth. Scholars extracted from that a deep principle of law. So, الْأَصْلُ فِي الْأَشَاءِ الْحِلْءَ وَالْإِبَاحَ So the basic uh, ruling of all things is permissibility. Anything on the earth, you can have it, you can use it, whatever you want to do in the world, do it. That's the basic ruling of Islamic law. Unless and until God has a verse that He revealed in the Qur'an, or a hadith that the Prophet ﷺ has been confirmed to have said, this is, this is bad for you, don't do it. That's the exception. You got Muslims living the haram police. A brother asked me the other day, well, uh, show me how it's permissible to set off fireworks for the 4th of July. I said, it's a celebration. We're making everybody happy to remember something that is a good thing for all of us. We're here celebrating our mosque, its existence, and our freedom to practice and teach our religion to others. So we are shooting off firecrackers, and the Prophet said, to put happiness into the people is good, it's salah, it's charity. That's what we're doing. But you're wasting all this money. So decorating your house is a waste. Decorating for any occasion. How about all these lamps we get in the Muslim world for all that waste of money? 
right? It's okay. It's decoration. It's good. It's called a taxi yet in Islamic law. It makes an occasion better. But unless the Quran or the Sunnah says you may not shoot firecrackers, you shouldn't be talking like this. The basic ruling is permissibility. The brother was thinking maybe it was a waste. But it's not a waste. It would be a waste to just throw away the money or burn it. But what's being done with the money is a process of appreciating something good and beneficial and making kids happy and smile and say, oh wow, look at the colorful and all that. It's not just wasting money. Let me, let me throw this one at you. Now, I've personally come to my own conviction. I'm not giving you a fatwa because it's, it's, it needs a lot of research and scholars need to form the official ruling yeah, because it's not really... But a lot of the sweets from the Muslim world, it's literally a ball of sugar. You're paying money and you're making the sugar. Is there any benefit to you to eat this thing? Actually, the scientists say it's very harmful to you. And the prevalence in huge, larger percentages of diabetes and other issues in the body is a result of this. In the Muslim world, big diabetes problem, more than any other country is the Muslim country. Because they eat all that sugar on top of a bunch of rice, carbs galore. I was telling the brother, should we be eating the sweets that you're eating? Is that wasting? <laughs> Maybe that's my crew. Wallah, I don't know. So we have the sustenance to test. So here's an interesting thing. There is studies that show that matter, this is called quantum physics. Anybody study quantum physics? Okay. Maybe we're going to go too far with this. We'll leave that one off for now because we're running out of time. It's interesting because, I mean, I'll just leave it. You can go study it. It's, to, to break it in the tafsir is maybe a long stretch for you. Um, when a computer is observing matter and how it functions, uh, it reacts differently than if a human being is looking at it. In the basic essence of matter, atoms, and, and molecular elemental interaction, if a human being is interacting with it through perception, it acts differently. Meaning we have a connection with it that we, we need to be careful about. Now, here's where people have issues in creed. Then he turned to the sky and he made it into seven heavens. Stawa in Arabic has many meanings. If you say ila, Stawa ila, it kind of gives the meaning to intend. To intend or to direct oneself toward or to begin doing. If you say stawa ala, it means to come over it. Stawa ala. And by itself, stawa means to become ready. Istawa. It's ready. When they cook the food, they say istawa al-akl. It has been properly cooked. Right? So now people say, what do you mean? God is moving? No. We don't know exactly how it is because number one, laysa kamitli ijay. There's nothing like it. Wa huwa samir al-basir. Just so that you know. And he hears everything and sees it. At the same time, he does not have eyes or ears because eyes and ears we know them so if you know what it is and you can quantify it in your mind the Quran and the Sunnah are clear and there's a consensus understanding you cannot describe God in that way so what we're learning is he has some sort of qualities and characteristics that are beyond our perception that's why we say all the time Allahu Akbar stop trying to bring down God to some human thought process that is the basis of shirk Shirk comes down, people said, okay, there's a creator, I can't figure it out. We need to make the statue, worship the God, worship the sun, worship the moon. Why? Because I can see it. It carries some significance. We can make it nice and beautiful. Now we can worship because we are intimately connected with it. No, you are intimately connected. He's closer to you than your jugular vein. He's with you wherever you are. Does that mean he's like an entity near me? No. We don't know. It's mystical. By his mercy and compassion and by his knowledge, he's surrounding it in 
everywhere. Is that like an entity, like a guy or like a thing? We don't know. Allah knows what he is. It's not our business. It's arrogance to assume my little speck of dust of a mind is going to wrap itself around the absolute truth of existence in and of itself and the wisdom behind all of functionality and the creative process of the creator of the universe. To, th under to believe my mind should be able to grasp that and understand it is foolish and arrogant. So whatever he said, that's what he said. He created the sky into seven heavens. Whatever that means. So some scholars say, well, he created the earth first. Then he created the sky. This is an opinion of scholars. Is that science? No. It's a scholarly opinion based upon his reading of the Quran. Are Muslim scholars of tafsir and theologians, are those scientists? No, they are not. Is the Quran a book of science? No, it is not. It's a book of guidance. Will you find miraculous statements that clearly show scientific truths? Of course, because the creator of the universe is the one talking about guidance. But should you take it as a book of science? No, because you say stupid things. The great scholars of Saudi Arabia and India, when, Muslim, when Americans first and Russians first went and took pictures from space, and they showed the picture, they said it was an official fatwa coming from Saudi Arabia. This is all a big conspiracy. The earth is flat. They said like this. What the heck are you talking about, dude? He said, I've read many verses to see Allah made the earth flat for you. Okay, it is flat for us. We see it like that. Does that mean that's the whole reality of the earth? No. Imam Fakhruddin al Razi, Allah, one of the great scholars of our time, uh, not of our time, eight centuries ago of his time, long before anybody knew anything about science, he made the tafsir. You go with layla ala nahr, you go with nahr ala layl. He said, "Hala yadulla ala kurwiyat al ard." He said, "The Quran says he's circling the day and the night around each other." So he said, "That means the earth must be a circular thing." It's his opinion based upon the ayah, and others did not pay attention to that one. Or because the word kura means what? Ba. You go. He makes it, rolls it like that. <laughs> so there's a famous thing about what about God and all this. Imam Malik, Imam Dar al Hijra, Imam Medina. He's having a class and he said, Fumbastawa al Laush. And then God established himself on the throne. So the guy said, Kayf al Istiwa, Kayf istawa Allah. The guy in the crowd, still seeker of knowledge, he went beyond the bounds of a reasonable question. He said, How is God uh, getting, uh, establishing himself or getting on top of a throne? Imam Malik said, Kalimat istiwa ma'ruf, lughatan. Majhul aqlan. He said, the word, istiwa, we know what it means in the Arabic language, which is your dilemma. How that relates to God is unknown and not knowable in your mind. Because why? There's nothing like him. And then the guy said, yeah, but how? And he said, wal kayfiya majhul. To know how that relates to God, you can't know it. Some scholars added that he said, وَالسُؤَالَ عَنْهُ بِدَعْ And to ask about these things is an innovation. You will find many verses of the Qur'an that carry some sort of meaning that if you go super philosophical with it, you will like question it. The Sahaba radiallahu asked about the law. Uh, the companions were asking the Prophet ﷺ many questions about the law, about the religion, about understanding what we're supposed to do and why and how we relate to the world around us. Those were questions. And Allah answered those questions. Never did they say, why is Allah like this and like that and how like this? You know why they said that? You know why they did not ask those questions? Because they knew Allahu Akbar. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. They knew it. They understood that. I should not... We understand from their lack of question and discussion and 
you know, going into detail on this, because they, they knew that God is something above and beyond whatever they grasp. Whatever He said, it carries some meaning that Allah knows best what that really means, but we know kind of an idea about how that relates to us, and guidance-wise what that means to us. We'll leave it at that. We'll see on the Day of Judgment, when we go to heaven, we'll know all that that we need to know right now. One of my shaykh, he told me whenever we got into an argument, some me and some other student, I was arguing, I said, you said Allah has hands. He said, yes, Allah has hands. We have to believe that. You should tell everybody, never deny Allah that has hands. And I was like, you mean like this? He was like, no, he could have a hand, but it may not be like that or like this. It may be like a different, like you have a hand of a door and all that. I was like, all these examples you're giving are things we know about. And the Quran said he's not like anything we know. So why are we even having this? Sheikh said, exactly. He said, uh, the unseen, the hereafter, God, all that day of judgment, Allah knows best. We have some idea about it. It's not our focus. Because guess what? It doesn't affect how you live your life. The law, the religion, what's the rules, why, what's the purpose, the principles, the foundation, the intents of the law, that we need to understand. We need to have big, deep discussions about it. But trying to figure out God and His nature and how He is and what He does and why, that's something beyond us. Allahu Akbar. Keep saying Allahu Akbar. Why? Because at this point, keep Him up where He is and don't bring him down. That's why the ayat of course it ends, وَهُوَ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ He is Al-Ali. Can you name your child Ali? Can you name your kid Ali? Well, of course. Ali never told him. We can't say, do we have to say Abdul Ali? No, because the Prophet would have been the first to figure that out. So Asma Allah Husna, you can name the kids about this one? We're, we're having an epiphany right now. Of course you can. This is the proof. The only one you can't is Allah and Rahman. And something strange. Why would you name your kid Mumit? Mumit! What are we calling him? Why would you say that? Giver of death? Strange way to call some person. People invent stuff on their own. So here's another interesting thing. If you ask a meteorologist, studier of in Arabic, the word sama, it means kullama ala fahuwa sama. In Arabic, anything over you is a sama. This is the sama al ghurfa. It's right here. And then above that is sama al mark is between that one and that one. Now you have that, and then above that. And, then, and we, they, they, they found out, they said, after scientists studied really deeply everything about the atmosphere, from the earth, this one, and then all the way up until it becomes space, and then it's no longer related to the earth, they said there's seven. So, uh, is that what that means? I'm giving you an attempt. Allah Alam. It's interesting how Allah said He created seven heavens above you. And then they said in the science modern, they said the seven. And He has absolute knowledge over all things. So He knows everything. Past, present, beginning, middle, end, it's all the same. We had some of the high school kids, they came to me and said, Amen. What is this thing that God knows everything, even knows what I'm going to do? He knows I'm going to heaven or hell. All that. And I was like, yeah. I'm like, well, so why am I even alive? And I was like, because you're living. He's not in time. You are. Well, what if I pray to him? If you pray to him, he has already answered your prayer. And if you didn't pray, he didn't. It's already happened. Because why? That's why he says, can Allah ghafur Past to him is, is always like that. Everything's already happened. In time is not something he functions in. He created it. This is where this concept right here about creation and God, you have to separate creation and creator. I don't mean to go too philosophical with you. But if you do, you'll understand why we keep having this problem. We're like, well, before everything was created, there was no such thing as before. Mm -hmm. now, didn't you? That, there was a law. And that is not a beginning or a middle or an end or there's no time to it. We have a beginning, but there was no before that because it always is. So his knowledge is there. Does he make you do what you do because he knows what you're going to do before you do it? No, he just knows your whole life. He has already interacted with you. Does that make it useless and that you don't have a choice? No, you're living in your time. You're making decisions, and how you choose to live your life, at the end, it will matter when you die. With Ibrah bil Khawatim. And the point of focus and the point of reference is at the end, how are you? This is, people think that there's a hadith. You all heard the hadith? 
someone lives their whole life righteous Muslim and all that, and then the day before they stop their belief and all that, and then they end up in the hell. Somebody is an evil, terrible person their whole life, and then a day before they die, they become a believer and all that, and then they end up in heaven. Have you heard that hadith? Mm-hmm. Some people think that hadith is some sort of sick game. I mean, they won't, they won't admit that's what they're understanding from it, but they're like, yeah, Allah is just going to do that to you. Allah didn't do it to you. When it says, Sabaq al-Kitab, he are, what it means is his knowledge about it, and the fact that he allowed it to happen is there. But guess who made that decision right before death? You did. What the hadith is, it's not a philosophical discussion about how God's going to hit you with something right before you die. It's saying, take your faith seriously every single day and don't let your guard down lest this happens to you. And don't ever give up hope on the one who's lived their whole life as a corrupt person because you don't know maybe tomorrow is their day. That's the lesson of the hadith. <coughs> Not some sick game that God plays with people. Like, I have heard people say, I have the imam talking about one time. I was like, what the heck is he trying to say? And that concludes our discussion for today. Any questions? Yes, brother. What do you translate as heaven when you say sky? It depends, you know, because heaven and sky, even in English, kind of means the same. Like whenever in ancient British English, when you say the heavens, it means the sky, right? So heaven as like Jannah, as a meaning of, of the place of heaven. And we get this thing that heaven is up. Why? Because it says, it says that uh, there's Sabah uh, Samawat, and then it says that there's the whole creation, and then there is a throne. How is that thrown? What is it like? I don't know. On the Day of Judgment, we'll know for sure. So it's none of my uh, use of knowledge to figure that out. It will happen. And God is somehow above everything. Mm-hmm. Right? Somehow. How is that exactly? I don't know. Right? That's just how He is. Why? Because it says He sends down the revelation. Gabriel gets the revelation and brings it down from Him. Min indillah. And it comes up, إِلَيْهِ يَسْعَدُ الْكَلِمُ الطَّيِّبُ وَالْعَمَلُ الصَّالِحُ يَرْفَعُ The angels go up to him. This is what we know from scriptures. So, what that means, I don't know exactly, but that's how we know how it is. So, is Jannah someplace above? It appears that way, but we're not sure because it's غيب. It's unseen. And so to specify is a polemic that would be dangerous. Because here's where people analyze the unseen world with philosophical logic. And then if they're wrong, and you tell everybody think like this and believe like this, this is why I love, I'm a big student of Ibn Taymiyyah. In law, I'm a big student, I'm a big admirer. In the creed, I think, Rahimullah Ta'ala, and I'm nobody to, I'm not a drop of the ocean of his knowledge, but he went way overboard with his books on belief systems. Like, okay, whatever the Qur'an said is true, why, why are we talking right in all these books about it? So let's believe the Qur'an, whatever it said, that's the way it is. Allah knows best how that is. Why we got to try to prove them wrong and prove our right and our way of understanding it is the correct one and that's what the Sahaba really meant by not saying anything in some great detail. Okay, well, they, they thought it wasn't something we should talk about. Why are we talking about it? Yeah. So, yeah. the Sahaba now has come from the view we have the reception of the against is black. I think you'll see them on the earth as as uh, spiritual. Yeah, so it's up on up for you, it's not for somebody else on the outside. Yeah, yeah. So when is it where's up? Yeah, yeah. So, you brought up this way, that's exactly that's, that's this exact point he's making is why I say That's why I always say like that. Mm-hmm. Allah knows best what that really means. Mm-hmm. Right? Because if you start to think about it, you realize it's something beyond my grasp. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. How do you translate uh, so, um, inshallah, Khalid is a student of the <laughs> So, tajsee means to claim something has a body, a physical form. Tashbi is to say that it is like something else. And tamthil is like it is functioning in a way of something else. Right? This is the active function. Tashbi is like it's like this is like that. These two things are the same. Tamthil is like this one acts like that. 
مثل يعني تمثيل يعني you give an example of functionality. So when you start saying, if you say like God is like a being like this, right? Now you're doing blasphemy because you are giving him a body. And it's clear when we say him, this is an Arabic mechanism of linguistics, as all languages historically, Latin, Spanish, French, you have masculine words, feminine words. So this is Bawina, table, right? And for example, uh, this is Kitab, book. This is a masculine word, that's a feminine word, it's just the way words are. So the word for God happens to be a masculine word. Now, unfortunately, in our history, we have Muslim scholars that say, well, the reason why Allah inspired it that way to show that men are closer to Him than women. That is an absolute invention of their minds. What we know is it's a linguistic reality, and that's what it is. And there are, by the way, some languages like the Native American language that refer to like the Mother Earth. You know, they, they talk about it and think feminine. So, uh, either way, God is not a male or a female for sure, intifaqa, right? So, be is to say, God is like this. That's why I was having an argument with the brother. He's like, well, it could be, you know, like there's a knob, there's a hand of the bab, the yid of the bab, and yid this and yid that. Why are we bringing up these examples? You do a be. Don't make examples like God, and don't say He functions like others. So, like we said about that, it's not Allah Husna. Is God uh, Rahim, Wadud, Karim, Rashid, Manan? He's all of those. Can people be merciful, compassionate, kind, gentle? Yeah, all of those we can. But our doing that is not kamal. That's why we're not al karim We're kareem. We can be generous. But he is al karim Istighraq al ma'na. To give full, complete meaning of the word in its perfection. What it, meaning at all times God is being generous. In complete form. Never did he become a little bit less generous. Or, whereas we're always, most of the time, not generous. Right? So... Except for exemplary people like Rasulullah and still he uh, felt bad sometimes that he could have done this or could have done that. This is where he's saying stuff for Allah. Because he did that but he thinks I could have done this too. For him that's a stuff for Allah. For us it's like, mashallah, look what I did. I'm doing that. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah. So we talk about the souls, right? Uh, they were in one place. So mm -hmm. I heard somewhere that your spot is your spot because you were closer there in Barzak. With your soul was with her, and that is why she is your spot. And you meet the people uh, more friendly, or you are close to the people because you were close there. Also. Is that true? Um, so there's a it's a misunderstanding of a hadith that I've heard this. And so basically, as the Prophet Sallallahu said, "Arwahu junudun mujannada." فَمَا تَعَرَفَ مِنْهَا اَتَّلَفْ وَمَا تَنَاكَرَ مِنْهَا اَتَّلَفْ So the, basically what he's explaining here is he's saying that the, the Prophet said that the souls are all kind of uh, created as they all function for a similar purpose. They all work together for, and they're fighting for the same cause as it were. And so those that get to know each other, they will unify and connect and those that turn their backs on each other, they will be indifferent and all of that. I understand the hadith that you meaning you should get to know people and benefit from knowing them and you will grow as a person and then the world will be a better place. As long as we're us and them and I fear them and they're different and we're not like them, then you create problems in society and in the world, which is basically the source of all of our wars and all the problems and poverty and all that. Because people don't care about each other. So um, people are taking that in some mystical meaning be like what it means is before we were created, we all knew each other. So those that knew each other come and they used to know connecting here on earth and say, I don't think that's the correct understanding. Well, I think you just randomly make a decision who you're going to get married and then, you know, you make your istikhara and then Allah will bless you with that one and then you're supposed to make jihad to make that work because now you connect in front of Allah and if it's not, then it's not and then you go to another one or you don't or whatever. Well, جزاكم الله خيرا سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك شهدنا لا اله الا انت استغفرك واتوب اليك